Hello, good morning. And how are you? Welcome to my rattly old team. Let's get you some visibility. Nice and early this morning. First day back. I've been to Cornwall for a wedding. Drove 700 miles in five days. I know everyone says that Cornwall's a long way away, but God damn it. Quite got used to the clutch on this car, yeah, either. Yeah, me. I'm used to driving a Ford Galaxy. But it needs a little bit of, uh, you know, throttle to get it moving. Whereas this car has got a different biting bite point on the clutch, you say. Anyway, how's it going? It's a lovely day for filming. Grey, wet, overcast, omnidirectional light. Look at that, look. That's better than some than just some pretty bright area and some dark area, isn't it? So yeah, so we've got quite a busy day today. But when I say busy, I've got one filling and the rest of them are checkups and fitting whitening trays and I think I've got one crown to fit. So all in all, not a bad day, it's gonna be fine. We always say that the first day back after a week off is hectic, but this one's not gonna be hectic. I mean, we think it's gonna be hectic, but it turns out not to be hectic. I did have one patient who uh, has had a bit of trouble, post-operative pain following a root filling, but um, we tend to find that's like an um, ethnic uh, problem, you know? Yeah, so some people have trouble after root fillings and it packs up after a day or two, but there, there are a couple of groups that constantly uh, go on about the fact that it's really, really painful and it's uh, agony and they, do they need to go to accident and emergency and do they need antibiotics, do they need painkillers? The stupid thing is that they never take painkillers. You tell them to say, you say, look, I need you to alternate ibuprofen and paracetamol every two hours, up to the maximum dose. And then when they come back in, how has it been? Oh, terrible, Mr. 12 out of 10, 12 out of 10 on the pain scale. Okay, and uh, have you been alternating the painkillers? No, I didn't bother with that. No, I didn't, I haven't done that. I've done that. Like, you know, what are you supposed to do? Anyway, I think she went to um, A and E in the end, got some antibiotics. Of course, it, it always happens. I mean, it's unlucky for someone that the dentist is away when they have trouble. But on the other hand, you can't say, "Well, the dentist has just got to be there the whole time." I know the Department of Health would like to say yes. It's your responsibility to make sure that you've got patient can obtain treatment seven days a week, twenty-four hours a day. But uh, that's not, I mean, that's not realistic. You know, they're looking at hospital trusts and things like that. Uh, they're not looking at, and even the hospital trust don't have, uh, you know, you try and bring in a hospital dentist at two o'clock in the morning or uh, 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning or something, you know, they don't do it. And so I think we uh, expect, we push ourselves a bit too hard sometimes. I mean, my patients will get responses out of ours. Uh, from me, whenever they, uh, you know, like usually within an hour or so, I notice that someone's emailed me and I will email them back. Even if it's inconvenient, you know, even if I'm sitting there watching a film with the family, I'll uh, we'll either stop the film and make a cup of tea or I'll just wrap off a quick reply on my phone, etc., etc. So that people know that, you know, I'm there for them. You know, I'm listening to them. I'm, I'm not out of contact. But... Um, uh, the, you know, if you're a dentist and you're going to take time off, let's say you take a week off, there's going to be some unlucky so-and-so is going to have all of their trouble that week, right? The week that you're not there. I mean, I wasn't there. I was in Cornwall. I couldn't. I wasn't. I couldn't have come back and opened the surgery even if I wanted to. Now they can. They're free to go to any other private dentist. 
I mean, well, there's no difference in a way in an emergency between seeing me, a private dentist, me as an emergency, and private dentist, someone else as an emergency. And I do appreciate that they would rather that they could come back to me. But, you know, at the end of the day, they're going to see a private dentist for emergency treatment, which is, you know, I just imagine for the most part, it's going to be quite a reasonable standard. It's the NHS uh, emergency services that are, are the worrying ones, you know. The ones where they won't see you, even though you are in a lot of pain. Or the ones that where you ring them up and they just say, I'm sorry, we're shut. Or just don't even answer the phone, you know, that's the, the NHS standard. So, what have we done lately? Well, last week, you know, we're always the first to try new things. We're very fleet and nimble, and we pivot quickly. We're flexible, and we incorporate best practice in, you know, within 24 hours or so. So we were thinking about uh, checkups. And because of the collapse of NHS dentistry, we are um, seeing a lot of patients who are coming in really in extremists, as I've said before. You know, they're not just got toothache, they've had toothache for a year or two and been through four dentists who haven't fixed it and then, and then come to see us. So, we also, we've got this big uh, problem with um, Governments just increase the, M, the broad money, M2 money supply, uh, you know, ridiculously. And uh, as a result, that inflation in the money supply has led to inflation in consumer prices as more money chases a vastly reduced uh, supply of goods and services. You know, also, thanks to the fact that the government shut the economy down for two years. And so, uh, while well, dumping money into the economy and then, and then preventing people from producing anything. So, and then they wonder why inflation is at 10%, uh, consumer price inflation anyway. So we thought uh, what we do is instead of having a single flat rate checkup fee, uh, £45, we're going to have a 35 a 45 and a 78 And, you know, some of you are probably already doing this. So, I mean, I'm not going to say it's revolutionary. But the point is that for the people who come in on a regular basis, by which I mean six to nine months, or well, let's put it another way, keep it Department of Health Suite, within three months of their meticulously analysed and uh, worked out by artificial intelligence recall date. Um, if they come in within three months of when they were invited to come in, then we give them a 10% discount. A £10 discount is more than 10%. So they, don't, they only pay 35 instead of 45 Now the regular customers are going to see this as quite a decent uh, uh, break, you know, because I'm, I'm not kidding you, when I bought that surgery, which I was just 60 pounds or something for a checkup, then I put it down to 58, then I put it down to 45, and now we've got it down to 35, which in this, you know, days when people are having trouble making ends meet, I think that's, that's quite a commendable uh, attempt to try and keep their costs down. And I hope they see it as that because you know they are. We are going to be doing away with um, ten pounds. But from the on the, the sort of the top-down view, bigger picture, um, I'm hoping it's going to encourage more of our patients to come back on a regular basis, rather than making the surgery wholly dependent on patients who've just come in because they're in pain. Um, and to be honest with you, new patients do cause uh, us a lot of admin. You know. I mean, let's say on an afternoon where I've got, say, three new patients, I will be late that e that afternoon because I'll need to uh, write down everything about their visit, um, which will be a lot because it'll be the first time they've had a chance to get it all off their chest. And so we write everything down and then we look at their x-rays, we analyze their x-rays, uh, then we send them a treatment plan. Uh, well, then, then we have to plan the treatment, you know. I mean, we have to do the examination, diagnosis, and treatment planning. So we do the treatment plan, which might be, you know, three or two or three options. You know, metal denture, bridge, implant, um, 
and uh, over, I don't know, anything up to say six visits, and then uh, put it all in a quote and uh, email it off to them. And the quote is quite frequently, I mean, easily 10 pages long and uh, quite frequently 14 pages long, depending on what they um, have done. Now, I'm not saying I have to type 10 pages for every patient. I mean, a lot of it is quite a plate text, but... Um, Death. We have to be quiet on the junction of death. There we go. But um, you know, people want a personalised quote. They want something that shows that you've listened to what they had to say, that you've understood what their problems are you've understood what their priorities are uh, and that you've uh, you competently come up with a solution uh, or, or a bunch of alternatives which, you know, are, are what they are looking for. Um, and this is uh, sales as much as anything, you know, I mean, uh, you don't ever sell someone something you want to sell them. You sell them a solution to a problem that they've got, sometimes that they didn't know they had, but <coughs> you uh, find out what they are, uh, want to achieve and then you uh, convince them that you've got the answer and then they're like oh well that's you know especially men well okay I've been that's the answer I've been looking for and so then money suddenly ceases to become a problem because if you're getting exactly what you want then money's not an issue if you're not getting what you want then money is either an issue or no amount of money is going to, no amount of discounting is going to sell something that is something that someone doesn't want. You know? As I tried to explain to the guy when I cancelled my subscription to the Times, he was like, "Oh, you're getting a good price. You're getting, a, you won't get this price again." He said, "We can, we, I'll guarantee we can keep this good price for you, but not if you cancel." And I'm like, "You don't understand. I'm, I'm cancelling the Times because I don't want it. There's no amount of cheapness." <laughs> Induce me if you charge me a penny a year, that'd be a penny wasted because I don't want it. <laughs> so he gave up in the end. Anyway, uh, so we're doing this, uh, and, and the, the, the time limits are basically let's assume a six month recall, okay? It makes just makes the maths easier. So if they come within six to nine months, then it's 35. If they come within 9 to, uh, I think it's 18 months, 9 to 18 months, then it's 45. And then if it's over 18 months since they've come, then uh, it's 78. And that's on account of the fact that we will almost certainly need to do more bite wings and uh, yeah, they'll have more problems or they'll be coming with a specific problem that needs fixing straight away or um, uh, that they, they honestly don't. Uh, take any of our advice and they don't want to come in for regular checkups and they want to come in on an ad hoc basis um, You know by the time they get over 18 months. I mean they've missed three checkups, haven't they? So that's the hundred and five uh, They could have they would have paid so they're getting away with 78 which is you know a reduction really and um, For the vast majority of people who come in uh, within 18 months, um, they're going to they're pay 45, which is what they pay now anyway. So, you know, for them, it's going to be absolutely transparent. There's going to be no difference at all. Oh, yes, these brakes. Brakes on this car are not as good as they are on the Galaxy. Now, what are the downsides? The downsides are, for the regular patients, obviously, we'd be losing 10 pounds. For the uh, receptionist, there's an increase in the workload because she's going to have to do a quick bit of mental maths to try and work out how long it is since they had the last checkup. And our computer system does say last checkup was blah, blah, blah. So, um, you know, she's going to need to just because we invoice people in advance. 
So she's going to need to just work that out so that she knows how much to invoice them. That's what it boils down to. Uh, and then obviously we've altered the um, reminder letter that says, uh, you know, you'll do a checkup to say you'll do a checkup, and if you come in within three months, um, we'll give you a ten pound off, and you don't need to do anything. This will be automatically applied when you make your checkup. Basically, you're going to get invoiced for thirty five instead of forty five, um, and this on top of the the fifteen pounds that they get for referring a new patient. So anyone who refers a couple of new patients and comes in regularly is going to be paying five pounds for their checkup. And you can't, you know, I mean, that's about as good as it gets in terms of private dentistry. Obviously I'm worried about ten, the 10% inflation because although we've given our staff a couple, a couple of pay rises uh, this year, I need to just work out whether or not, I'm pretty sure they've had 10%. So, and they seem to be fairly happy, you know, I'm always asking, do you want more money, blah, blah, blah. Is everything okay? Are you having problems? Are you having financial problems? Because I believe in keeping on top of issues. Um, you don't want to find out that your staff can't afford to work for you on the day that they give in their notice. Really, it's absolutely nothing much can be done at all when a member of staff gives in their notice. I've only ever turned around one resignation and that was because uh, the woman found that she was pregnant and uh, if she carried on working for me she'd get her maternity pay, whereas if she left she wouldn't. So, I don't know. Where's the it? Standing around at a bus stop on a rainy day. Mind you, used to do it when I was a child. Didn't do me too much harm. Turn that down a bit. Noisy, isn't it? Noisy. Oh. So, um, yeah. We work in a shared building and the building's got a facilities manager who doesn't know how to manage a facility. And the maintenance is done by the bloke who's the husband of the previous facilities manager, which is how they used to award contracts. Basically, if the husband was out of work and he needed a job, they used to award him the facilities management contract on the basis that he really didn't do an awful lot. So the place is looking shabbier and shabbier. We have, after a year, managed to um, get some money out of them for uh, three square metres of new grass, which, you know, they didn't water until we reminded them that you need to water turf, and which is just about established now. But as it's not, well, as it is not, and we will not get mowed regularly, and it's now, you know, starting to sprout weeds. Uh, and within a year, we'll be back to the scrub grass that it replaced, you know. And my um, suggestion as to how to manage these uh, little islands of grass uh, was, was disregarded. Because they don't take any notice of anything the tenants suggest, even though in many areas, such as um, internet, phones and stuff like that, They've got a wealth of experience within the tenants uh, as to what's the best way to do things. And certainly what the tenants want, you know, I mean, they put in a voice over internet phone system, which we rented off them for about two months and then we just gave it back and said, no, we're, gonna, we're going with Vonage, you know, we'll do our own VoIP system. Uh, which has the advantage that our phone number is portable. When we move, I can just like my Vonage box in somewhere else and we still and all the phone calls will come through whereas uh, you probably heard me mention before uh, the phone number we used to have was in a block of phone numbers that was uh, assigned to them and um, although you're technically supposed to be able to uh, move your business number with you when you move your business you're supposed to have a right to uh, you don't if you sublet on a business park and it's a block 
of numbers that doesn't belong to you, but they sort of lead to you by the business part. It's their number you're using. So I'm pleased to say, although that was a bit of a, uh, what's the word, uh, upheaval at the time, uh, and a bit of a worry uh, over how long it would take to convert everybody to our new phone number, it, it pretty well went without too much trouble. You know, we had a few months where people were ringing the old number. Um, and um, we had to get some of our stationery reprinted and stuff like that. But then that's years, that's in the past now, that's years ago, you know. But we are, um, I'm pleased to say, I'm pleased to say that inflation is eroding the cost of our dentistry. So hopefully people who are getting pay rises are starting to find that we are relatively cheap. But as I say at the moment, it's a bit of a moot point really because uh, people have changed their dental habits and that they're not coming back. A few people still are, you know, coming in for regular checkups, but um, the vast majority are, you know, especially when they come to a practice like ours where we do put a lot of work into dealing with the root causes of stuff, these two is the pun. Um, you know, we look at their brushing, we get them to chew up disclosing tablets, we show them the plaque, we, they can see how to brush. Um, their gums stop bleeding, their gums get pink and, and, and cease to be red and swollen. Um, we tell them about their diet, cakes, biscuits and sweets and fizzy drinks. We tell them that, um, you know, we don't make any compromise about these food groups. And uh, that the answer to, would you like a cake, would you like a biscuit, or would you like a fizzy drink, is, is, is a plain no, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I'm going to have some squash or I'm going to have some melon and grapes or whatever. Um, and that, um, you know, there's no amount of sugar is, is good. And um, which conflicts, you know, quite frankly, with the government message, which is the food industry message, which is that little of what you fancy is, you know, doesn't you do you any harm. And uh, that's exactly what they'd want to, that, that's the meme, the idea that they're trying to put in the idea of the public, which is that, uh, you know, it's okay to you, you, yod bowl of Frosties or your um, golden syrup or Wherever you you know sprinkling uh, sugar on uh, sugar in your tea is not such a, a problem, but uh, you know why not have a biscuit with your with your morning break? Uh, why not um, uh, fall into the Mary Berry army and just bake cakes to the point where nobody wants them because you've made so many you can't give them away and you can't eat them all yourself. Um, why not, if you're in the car, have a jelly baby or two? You know, surely a jelly baby or two is not the end of the world, is it? Um, and, you know, I, that's that's the what they want people to think. Whereas, of course, um, it's all cumulative. So your biscuit adds on to your cake, adds on to your jelly baby, adds on to your fizzy drinks, and then before you know it, you're... Um, You've got toothache and you've got a tooth completely collapsed. And uh, even though you didn't think you were ever going to need to visit a dentist for the rest of your life. And uh, your teeth have never given you any toothache. All of a sudden there you are. And you've got raging toothache. Which is what keeps us busy as the profession. Even during times of high inflation and low economic growth low wage growth um, it's like uh, being a statutory body it's, if you're going to be a body you want to you be a statutory body because then you can tax people and just say it's the law you know I'm sorry I can't help you you know you've got to register your x-ray machine with the council pay them some money is the law you've got to uh, register your practice with that completely useless quango the care quality commission that makes no difference at all 
uh, it's the law. You know, you have to pay your GDC subscription, whatever they say it is, because it's the law. That's great. And, and when you've got the law backing you up like that, you can take diabolical liberties. But when we've got laws of nature backing us up as dentists, and uh, the law of nature is that uh, in a society which is addicted to sucrose, um, people are forced to seek our advice and help through, um, because if they don't, they, they're in excruciating pain. If we don't put them in excruciating pain. We relieve the pain, we get responsibility for it, but we don't, you know, we're the pain relievers. People don't blame themselves, funnily enough, for getting toothache, uh, which they should. Well, they certainly do once they've been to see me. <laughs> It's like barbers, you know, if you want to have a job for life, get yourself in the barbering profession. All you need is a empty unit, a chair, a sink, a pair of scissors and a, and a, a clipper. You can practically learn on the job. But um, you can't blame a barber because your hair grows. I mean, that's it. And in the same way as you can't blame a dentist just because you've got toothache. And, you, and a lot of the, you know, I was talking about Italians and Ukrainians who seem to share a aversion to pain. Then you can't, um, you can't blame the dentist because you had a problem and as a result of the solution, um, you're, you're in pain. I mean, you know, you shouldn't be, ideally, but, you know. You can't ask someone to do what a root treatment is, basically, uh, and, and guarantee you that they won't, you won't be in any discomfort afterwards. It's just not possible. A lot of these infections are long-standing, and when you get in there, you, you stir them up, and, you, um, and they become acute. They were chronic, and now they become acute, and then you get the blame for that. Anyway, I might close now because we got stuck in a queue. So, in fact, I've uh, been delayed a bit. So, I won't further on for the sake of it. I can't. Uh... All I was saying is that we're going to um, review our fees, possibly. Um, although I don't like doing it more than once a year. You know, I'd rather put them up 15% in April than put them up 5% three times a year because I don't think it's good for the patients just you know every fee rise is is a fee rise as far as they're concerned they don't really look at how much it is the trust government is um, going to take an interesting approach to economics in so far as uh, they're going to go for growth they're going to give the Bank of England a 2.5% growth target, I think, and to hell with the uh, the money. You know, they've worked out that while they're not the... Um, while we, we have borrowed more than we should and we are in a debt spiral, we're not in as bad a debt spiral as we could be. <laughs> so they've decided to um, spiral it up a bit more, you know. The, the one last... They're doing a Hail Mary spend uh, by spending more and, and cutting taxes at the same time. So, And uh, they'll have to print the money to make up the difference. And because it's printing money and expanding the M2 money supply that's uh, caused the inflation, uh, we, we can expect to have high inflation for a while, as in five years or so, you know. But I've lived through 15% uh, inflation. It's all right if you can put your wages up. We can put our prices up, and uh, and as a result, you know we are one of the lucky few. If I'd retired uh, and I was relying on a pension, you know, my pension only went up. My NHS pension only went up three percent this year. Um, it's going to go up next year, I think, based on what inflation was last September or this September, I don't know, which is going to be about 10%. Um,
So I'll be interested to see if the pension goes up 10% or whether they're going to uh, renege on their promises like they did on the, um, the triple lock where they said the state pension would go up by the higher of either the consumer prices index I think or the average rate, 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 wage rise or inflation whichever was the higher and then when uh, that really started working for the pensioners they just said oh no sorry that was a joke we didn't mean that so So I'm looking forward to a 10-11% uh, rise in my NHS pension next year. In fact, chance of that. People don't realise that someone has to pay for all this government spending when they uh, print the money just to get out of their uh, negative budgets. And the people who pay for the spending are the uh, population in terms of um, reduced spending power. the money gets debased and so everybody pays everybody who's got a pound in their pocket is paying because it, it buys less and so you know you might think you're doing well because you're getting money off the government but you're not the government is getting far more money off of you so where are you going my friend So they're going to abolish the increase in uh, national insurance. Hopefully abolish the percentage increase and not the increase in the uh, threshold rate, which is what did me a bit of a favour. And then um, they're going to uh, not going to put corporation tax up from 19 to 25 percent, which is what Rishi Sunak proposed. And uh, and a ton of other stuff to try and get the growth rate up to 2.5%, which I don't think in, in living memory has never been that way. But anyway, I'll, I'll, perhaps I'll do something next Thursday when, when the sort of mini budget is and then we can have a good old laugh about uh, their um, lack of uh, economic uh, nows. All right, nice to talk to you. See you soon. Bye.